today for our prelude I'm going to play the song I couldn't play last Sunday. I got out my small boombox. It plays perfectly on it. I have no idea why the, the, the larger uh, one up here wouldn't work, but it, it still won't play it. But anyway, the song is the, uh, the Battle of Jericho. So please listen. This is from last Sunday. for being here today. Uh, it's Metaview Church, 768 Summit Road, Eden, North Carolina. And uh, it's a beautiful day. It's going to be hot after a while. It's been hot the last several days. But thank you for taking your time and effort to, to be here as we praise God, as we study His Holy Word, as we fellowship together and praise His Holy Name. For our announcements, look around and see who's not here. Let them know we missed them. Bingo is Tuesday nights. We, we've got a, a good crowd this coming and uh, having a good time. Pray for the countries of Ukraine and Israel. Uh, we need bingo prizes for uh, UNC Rockingham Nursing Rehab. Uh, canned foods for the food pantry at Spray. Uh, I mentioned last Sunday, but we still had a, a wonderful time in our ice cream social. Next Sunday, we're going to celebrate the 4th of July. It'll, it'll be June the 30th, but I'd rather celebrate beforehand rather than afterwards. 
So uh, you might want to wear some red, white, and blue uh, next Sunday as our sanctuary. And uh, we have new flags that we'd be putting outside uh, the front of the church. And uh, we'll uh, have a patriotic service next Sunday. Um, the following Sunday, July the 7th, is Music Sunday. So we'll be having a lot of music that, that Sunday along with a short, short sermonette. Um, do we have announcements that we need to share one with another? I know we got one birthday, Ethan. He turns 18. Uh, it seemed like you ought to still be just a little fella, <laughs> not an adult. So, uh, your birthday is it today? Okay. Any other birthdays? about anniversaries? Okay, let me move to the piano and we'll sing Happy Birthday. Rejoice in your birthday. Um, our first hymn, all of our all of our hymns and responsive reading is in the blue book today. If you'll turn your blue book to His Name is Wonderful, we'll sing it twice. It's found on page 174. Let us stand at your aid. 174. <clears throat>
Please join with me as we share our call to worship that comes from Psalm 43. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill. And to your dwelling, I'll praise you, O God. You may be seated. Please join with me as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker, maker of, of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, Christ, His only Son, our Lord, Lord, who was conceived by the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, born of the Virgin, Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here today. It's always great to see your smiling faces. Today, I brought someone new with me. I brought Otis. <laughs> Otis is a giraffe. Now, tell us what Otis stands for, please. Obedient, trust, invites success. Now, what that means is that when we put our trust in God and we do what he tells us to do, what he directs us to do, we're going to have success in our Christian life. We're going to be able to witness to others. Other people are going to listen to us because they trust us. They, they see a life that's a Christian life and they don't doubt what we're telling them. So re remember, obedient trust invites success. And, and God wants each one of us to be successful in our Christian witness. Now, some things about me. Uh, giraffes are the tallest mammals on earth. You know, our, 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 our necks really go up high. Our spots are unique. They're, they're a little different on, on different ones. In some places around the world we're called camel leopards because uh, camels because we're tall like a camel but we have the spots just like leopards have. We need very little sleep. Can you believe at night I only need about 30 minutes sleep? And I always sleep standing up. Our necks cannot reach the ground. In fact, when we lean over to get water, we have to spray our legs out to be able to reach over to get water. We can't just lean over and, and, and be able to, to get water from the watering hole. We have horns. And this is a type of bone that's covered with, with skin. And they're very useful in fighting. If, if, if I want a traditional uh, area, and of course we, we come from Africa, but, but sometimes I have to fight to have control of that, that area. And uh, those horns are very, very helpful in doing that. Uh, our legs are taller than most people. Our legs are about six feet long, and most of us aren't, aren't that long. And we have super long tongues. We eat foliage, flowers, berries that's high up in the trees. We can't lean over and eat the grass on the ground or things like that. We, we, we have to be able to things like that. And we have the same number of bones in our neck 
that humans have, which is seven. Just think, you've got seven bones in your neck? I've got seven bones in my neck. Our hoofs are wide. Think of a dinner plate. That's basically how wide the bottom of our hoofs are. And we can go up to three days without water. So, you know, a little bit of information about, about us. Well, Otis, thank you for coming today. And, and we'll try and remember to apply to ourselves what your name stands for. Obedient trust invites success. And as followers of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we want to be successful by doing what God asks each one of us to do. You have a blessed day and a great week, and we'll see you later. How has God blessed you this week? done the same thing for each one of us. Others. Went to the doctor and they put this nice green cast on and I found out good news that I'll get it off the week before we leave on vacation. So that was good news. Great news. <laughs> Congratulations on when you're going to be able to get it off. Others. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God, God is, is good. good. Absolutely. If you'll turn in your blue book to 380, there's within my heart a melody. Let us stand as you're able. 380.
Our responsive reading is found on page 738. 738. <clears throat> and we're reading from Psalm 1. And you can either sit or stand, doesn't make any difference. Please join with me. Blessed are those who do not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. On God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees, planted by streams of water, that yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do they prosper. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> the wicked flee, the wicked are not so, they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. You may be seated. We have many on our prayer list that we want to lift up today. Tabitha Godwin, our nation, David Moore, those not here today in our schools, James Stevens, Karen Johnson, the country of Ukraine, Lois Kizar, Dwayne Jeffries, Luann Joyce, Kay Price, UNC Rockingham Rehab, Ricky Hall, Cindy Bowling, Joe Bowling, Betty Booth, Micah Gardner, Mildred Leap, Laura Brown, the Simmons family, uh, Jimmy Seacrest, Christy Sweat, and please lift up Christy tomorrow. We, I'll be over at the courthouse tomorrow for a court hearing in, in that situation. Remember, all churches and uh, the United Methodist Churches, uh, this is their final session today in their annual conference at Lake Junaluska. Unspoken request, and we have many of those. Eden Rehab Center. Winona Price, Carol's daughter, the Thacker family, the country of Israel, Lawson family, Dorian Atha, uh, James Osborne, Jesse Carter, Joe Brown, uh, Carolyn Templeton, uh, Carolyn Doug, uh, the Rigney family, Anna Gant, Sandy, firemen and first responders, Kathy and Jim, and uh, I heard from Kathy yesterday, she's uh, doing a little bit better right now, so continue to to pray hard for, for her situation. Rim Bowling, Sally Kelly, Denver Shelton, Jessica Hatcher, Diamond Cable, Dennis Kendrick, uh, the Dalton family, uh, Medina, Tim's sister, and you said he's, she's coming to his house this week. Joe uh, Shelton, Mary Young, uh, uh, Rita Vernon, and the William Carter family. Do we have others we need to add or we need to uplift Tim? Uh, William, they're supposed to go in tomorrow and move some fluid off of his back. <clears throat> okay, so this is a different William than I saw in the, uh, the obituary list. <coughs> yeah, yeah, it's a different one. Okay, I'm, I'm yeah. Okay, so yeah, this, good news. <laughs> yeah, this one is, uh, this William is actually curious. My son in law, it's actually his uncle. Okay. He's also a cousin of ours. <coughs> so he's, he's the one that's got the back thing going on. And he said, uh, come on over there. And the way they talked, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it was just a matter of time. But actually, they're going to do something tomorrow to try to pull some fluid off his back. And they told him he probably would never walk again. But he, I went and seen him yesterday, and he looked good. Spirits and also, I'm going to add Tim Mize. Okay. He, he failed and actually broke his hip. Oh my but goodness. He's doing a lot better. He's at the White Shore in Greensboro. <coughs> and uh, we went and seen him yesterday also. And he's, he's doing a lot better. Yeah, now, now, most of us know Tim from the car lot. Yeah. Well, he's still working. He had his laptop going yesterday. So. He, <laughs> I'm still working, but he's, he's, he's doing a lot better. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. You shared things I wasn't aware of. 
others. And who is that? Okay. Thank you. Others. others. Let us pause for our meditation and our prayers, please. <clears throat> Father, you're so good to us. Thank you for being with us every day, 24 hours a day. You never leave us. You don't desert us. You so want good things for us, and we, we thank you for that. We thank you for the blessings that you send our way. Lord, there's so many people that are sick, and you know every single one of them. You know their needs. Please lift them up, remove their pain, help their bodies to heal. Be with those that are grieving. And Lord, be with those that are trying to solve all kinds of problems, whether it's individual problems, family problems, organizational problems, government problems, to just help us to, to find resolution. Lord, be with our country. Help us to once again be a nation under God. Help us to think about people and their needs. Help us to be able to protect our freedoms and our rights. Help us that we might have a, a place that we're not afraid to walk onto the streets and move about. Lord, be with this church. Help us as we move forward, not only to, to meet the needs of people that come to this church, but being able to reach out and share your love and your concern for others. Lord, lead and guide us. Help us to do your will. Give us courage, wisdom, energy, to follow your direction. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This time we'd like to take up our morning offering. Sarah and Suzanne. Let us stand as you're able for our doxology, please.
beautiful song. It's one of my favorites and, and it is for others also. And it it's, has such a wonderful message in it. Again, thank you. For our scripture today, I'd like to read from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 33. I'm reading from the uh, King James Version. Again, Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he, he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, 
his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest haply I three hath laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. All that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the others is yet a great far off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You shouldn't bet your life or even the next election on a public poll, but they can be worth some attention. Sometimes they reveal something about the religious attitudes in our nation, especially if the changes are large enough, large enough to indicate a, a real shift in public opinion. We've seen lots of shifts in opinion over the last decade or so. For generation, the vast majority of American people have identified themselves with some type of religion, whether it's Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or, or some other religion. Only a few have really classified themselves as having no religion or undecided, but maybe only three or four percent have identified themselves as atheists, not believing in God. The number of atheists probably hasn't changed much in the last decade. But the polls show that a marked increase in the percentage of the population that has no religious affiliation. This group, the unaffiliated, has shown the largest group of any in the polls. And in a sense, that shouldn't surprise us. It is a, a religious expression of a common postmodern attitude, an, an attitude that affects politics, institutions, life in general, as well as religion. It can be summed up in a simple statement. All ideas have the same value, some people say. You have your opinion? I've got mine. There's no need to argue about that because we're both partly right and we're probably partly wrong, some people say. Let's just get along with each other, others indicate. But here's an interesting attitude that runs right alongside this popular mood. Studies show that a great many people say something like this. I don't have any interest in organized religion, but I think Jesus is wonderful. He was a great man, perhaps the greatest person that's ever lived. Mind you, these folks don't usually belong to any church. They don't give any financial support to religious charities. But they admire Jesus. They say he's a great teacher, a miracle worker. He was a kind and loving man. Jesus ran into something with that same attitude in our scripture today. Listen to the first sentence again. Now large crowds were traveling with him. We know that he's on the way to Jerusalem. It's not going to be that long before he dies. Jesus walked from village to village with his disciples. He 
was teaching them every step of the way what he wanted them to learn and retain. But this voice tells us that other people were also traveling with him. Large crowds, our scripture says, was doing this. We don't know how many a large crowd is, but the word crowd means it's a good-sized number, a number large enough that it wasn't easy to estimate. And when you add that adjective large crowd, we can conclude that it was a good-sized group of people. And that large crowd, were they were traveling with him. It's remarkable because it means there were many people that were drawn to Jesus at that time and, and the distance didn't matter. They came wherever he was. They just wanted to be near Jesus. They wanted to hear something more. I don't think Jesus saw what was happening. What he was teaching was beginning to, to catch hold of the people. They were drawn to the. They didn't want to leave him. Common sense says that Jesus should now be pulling in the net. He should ask how many want to join his group. How many of this large group wanted to be a part of his team? I don't mean to be crude, but you'd think that, that Jesus might have asked the people to tell the name of their home village so that he could send one of his disciples to that community to organize them, to stay with them as their, their local leader. This is the way that movements grow. Instead, Jesus flew in the face of common sense. He said, whoever comes to me and does not hate their father and mother, their wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Even as I read that, I, I can, just can't quite believe what Jesus is saying. It's like the people who were with Jesus were startled. No doubt most of them had seen how loving Jesus was. Remember how Jesus had said, let the little children come to me. And how he stopped to heal the despised lepers. Had dinner with people that nobody else would be around people that were of disrepute. But now Jesus is saying essentially, unless you give me 100%, I have no time for you. You don't qualify for my discipleship. And if, if, if Jesus' first shocking statement wasn't enough, he went on to make his point still clearer. He gave an example. Suppose that you build a tower, Jesus says. Of course, you would first sit down and you would estimate the cost. Otherwise, you might get no further than simply laying the foundation and then running out of money. And he gave a military example. The kind that anyone in that war-torn world would understand the country is going to war. Its leaders will calculate whether the 10,000 men that they've got in their camp can win out over 20,000 in the enemy camp. These examples were very down to earth. Anyone in the crowd could get the point. If you intend to follow me, Jesus says, you had better calculate very carefully to see if you're ready to pay the price. And then he concluded with a tough, no compromise sentence. So therefore, none of you can become my disciples if you don't give up all of your possessions. That closing sentence must have cleared out the gathering pretty quickly. Perhaps it isn't surprising that when the church finally came to have birth on Pentecost, there may well have been just two or three months after Jesus was talking in the scripture. 
there were only about 120 people there with Jesus. Acts 1.15 tells us that. Jesus had fed thousands, tens of thousands, had heard him preach. They had seen him work miracles. But all that was left a few months later was about ten dozen people. So what does this have to say about Jesus in our postmodern world? Well, for, for one thing, it suggests that a vast majority of these people who say they love Jesus but don't like religious institutions probably have never read the scripture lesson that we're talking about today. This isn't a very lovable Jesus. This one who says that you have to lose your parents, your siblings, your children to follow him. True, he spends time with the little children. He heals the sick. He eats with the people that nobody else wants to be around. But he says, if you want to be my disciple, the price of admission is extremely high. How high? Everything you've got. Also, this story goes against the postmodern idea that every religion and every philosophy in life is of equal value. In this particular instance, Jesus doesn't actually say that his way is the only way. Although other places in the New Testament does say that in one way or another. In the scripture before us, Jesus doesn't compare his way with another way. He simply says that he asked full obedience, absolute loyalty, all-out commitment. If you aren't ready to give your whole person and all that is due to him, dear to us, to follow him, then we're not ready to be his disciple. That is, Jesus is saying, that we have to bet our lives on him. <clears throat> That's a, a very, very difficult saying. But let's think hard about it for just a minute. All of us bet our lives on something. We humans are creatures that make choices about our lives. One time, our possessions, our affections. Some people bet their lives on economic security. They decide early on that the most important thing in their life is that they have enough to live on and live at a, at a certain level, standard. Other people bet their lives on sensual fulfillment. Could be drugs, sex, sports, entertainment, but for them, the biggest thing in life, the thing that they live for, they bet their lives on, is sensual satisfaction. Still others bet their lives on success. It may be success on the golf course, in politics, in writing, in music, business, or simply having a good reputation. But they bet their lives on it. And some people bet their lives on love. Love for their parents, their spouse, their children, or their friends. That they believe that love given and returned is the most important thing in the world. And of course, some people, perhaps the largest number, bet their lives on a combination of two or three of these possibilities without even fully thinking through everything that's possible. You see, all of us bet our lives on something. And Jesus invites you and me to bet our lives on him. You and I can be very glad that Jesus leveled with us in this manner. The other options that we've mentioned 
don't usually tell us the price. Success, economic security, sensual satisfaction, they, they don't tell us that we pay for them ultimately with our lives. Jesus may seem very harsh when he says to the crowd, here's the price. Are you willing to pay it? But Jesus is telling the truth. We humans, we have to decide what are we going to do with our lives? And eventually we bet our lives on whatever it is that we've chosen. Are you willing to put everything in the hands of Jesus? All of us have had many opportunities in life. Some good things, some probably bad things. And we had to make decisions. Now, I can remember my own life. Lots of decisions that I made and Lots of them, thank goodness, were, were good. Some of them, not so good. Remember all the way back to uh, when I was 11 years old, two days short of my 12th birthday, when I was in a Baptist church and I gave my life to Jesus. Best decision I ever made. I remember being in that same church and sitting there when the church would sing without music because I was a male, I was 16 years old and had had six or seven years of piano and they totally ignored me. At the same time, the next door neighbor to me in Wentworth was the organist at Wentworth Presbyterian Church and she had me to meet her at the, at the church and showed me all about the organ and said, now, when I've got to be gone once in a while, I want you to play for me. And I did. And when I was 16, I left the Baptist church and became Presbyterian. Short time after that, Mom and Dad also left the Baptist church and became Presbyterian. And the, the organist said, Wayne, I want you to take over the organ. I'm going to move over to the piano. And I stayed there playing the organ for 11 years. I taught the adult Sunday school class. We, we had an interim pastor because our pastor died. Uh, our former pastor had been a missionary in China. He and, and the, our interim pastor, Dr. Dick, had been professors at Davidson College in the religion department. And, and Dr. Dick said one day while I was before I entered college, we was there had taught the Sunday school lesson and said, Wayne, one day you're going to be a preacher. <laughs> oh no, I'm not going to do that. He was right. Went to Mars Hill College. Uh, went to lots of different places, but that was the one that appealed to me the most, even though it was a long way from home up above Asheville. And God works in mysterious ways. A lot of times we make decisions or find ourselves in situations that, that we really didn't ask for. I didn't ask God or anybody else to put me in a Greek class for two years at Mars Hill College. I was the only non-ministerial student in the class. God put me there. Every student at Mars Hill had to take Old Testament and New Testament. I became the president of the Presbyterian Youth Fellowship there on campus and went to two world mission conferences. Met Aunt Effie, and that's another story I'll tell you about sometime. But I also met this missionary from Brazil. And we got to talking, and he evidently saw some hope in me or something. <coughs> He said, I, I would like for you, when this school year is over, to come to Brazil and be my assistant, agricultural missionary. I said, well, I've got to do a lot of praying about that. And I did. And uh, after a lot of praying and my parents praying, uh, I did not go to Brazil. 
who knows what might have happened if I had. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I was looking around even for a church. My first decision was to go to First Methodist. I had my letter of transfer sent to First Methodist. And then we had open house at Draper Elementary School and one of my students walked in with his parents. Randall Kendrick walked in with Becky and Arthel and said, we would like for you to come and visit our church. And I did. And my reasoning for going to First Methodist, I wanted to go to the church that needed me the most. And lo and behold, when I came here, I discovered that I thought none of you needed me more than First Methodist did. They didn't have an organ, but a few people in the congregation chipped in, and before long we had a, uh, an old used organ. It had tubes in it. Tells you how old it was. It lasted maybe about five years, and I ended up being the organist here for 11 years and the youth leader. We're always making decisions. Some good, some not so good. But, you, you know, we have to let God lead us. I had no intention of becoming an, a, a preacher. And yet God uh, stirred me so that I went through a nine-month program with the United Methodist Church. It's called the Candidacy Study. Uh, I had a, a, a supervisor and some of you knew my mentor during this time, Silas Strader, and ended up getting, uh, going through that, went, went to Statesville, and they gave me a psychological test to see if I was crazy. <laughs> Luckily, I passed it. <laughs> uh, they, they appointed me to uh, a three-point charge in Stokes County, but all of my work was basically at one church, Snow Hill. It was United Methodist, but they did the same thing that we did recently. And then in 1991, Orrin and Cecil came to Draper Elementary School and said, could we go to the district superintendent and ask him to appoint you as our pastor? And I said, yes. And the rest is history. You have had decisions to make. But it's not over. You and I both are faced with decisions today, this week, this year, the rest of our life. What does God want us to do? Does he want us to take our phone and call somebody and encourage them? Does he want us to send a card to somebody to let them know we're thinking about them? Does he want us to smile at somebody? that maybe doesn't see another smile that entire day. There's opportunities for each one of us to serve God and be a witness for the love and the care of God. Bet your life on God because our future is unbelievable. Let us pray, Lord. Thank you for guiding us. Help us to rely upon you and to bet our life on you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our closing hymn today is 370 in the Blue Book, Victory in Jesus. Let us stand as you're able. 370.
serve Jesus this week. It doesn't have to be big things, just little things make a difference in other people's lives, and it blesses us in return. And now go forth in peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.